years now, we've thirsted for the impossible. A combination of beauty, power, weight, and agility in any terrain. We've been promised fountains that were just mirages in the heat. When we cupped our hands to drink, only sand spilled through our fingers. The unicorn, the elusive, the impossible, like desert nomads, we remain unsated with no water to quench this endless drought. Could this rally dark horse finally be the oasis we see? Welcome back to the Everride channel. Is this much hyped Kove 450 rally just a Wish.com version of a Dakar rally bike? Or is it the real Moto Saya we've been waiting for? This colorful graph represents the results of thousands of respondents when asked where they'd rank the on and off road capabilities of dual sport and adventure motorcycles that they had owned. You guys ranked the Husqvarna FE350 and KTM500 as the unicorns of the dual sport world, meaning they had the most range of capability both on and off road. So where does the Kove 450 Rally sit in this colorful continuum of capability? Before we get started, this video has had no editorial input from Kove or GPX, the American importer. This is an actual review, not speculation, no stock footage, no AI script writing. I was allowed to hammer this bike around the Badlands for an entire week and then some. So for those of you who don't know me, who am I and why was I allowed to review this bike? My full-time job has been guiding off-road motorcycle rallies for the last six years in the Badlands of Southwest Utah. I've owned, tested, or ridden pretty much every major dual sport, playable dirt bike, or adventure machine built from 1990 on up. Why don't I do more reviews then? They're YouTube gold. Well, honestly, because most bikes feel the same these days and nothing really excites me. Reviews are massively overdone on YouTube and others cover that niche really well. I also have a crippling mental illness with massive imposter syndrome in which I constantly feel undeserving of everything from your views to my years of motorcycle expertise to the very air I breathe at times. Talk about brutal honesty. On a bike, I'm no Graham Jarvis or Skylar Howes, and I've never even been around the world, but I'd like to think that I have enough seat time on enough motorcycles to give an honest opinion and add at least a modicum of value to my community of fellow middle-aged, moderately overweight weekend warriors. So we'll start this brutally honest review with brutal honesty, a spoiler, and by addressing the Kove's biggest problem. Spoiler alert number one, right up front, this is not going to be another Jeremy Clarkson style review where I say, oh, I'm gonna bash this boy, but then I love it at the end of the review. No, I love this motorcycle. I love the Kove 450 Rally. drafting this review, I started to really worry if I was overhyping it. As I mentioned before, I already suffer from intense imposter syndrome, and the last thing I want to do is tarnish my actual reputation with an overblown review. Happily, I was able to ride the Kobe again, and was ecstatic that it remained every bit as good as I remembered it. How good? Well, if you've seen my past reviews, you know that I'm a huge fanboy of my 2022 KTM 500 Six Days. Well, I'm giving the Kove any reviewer's biggest possible thumbs up and buying one for myself. And to afford it, I'm selling that same KTM 500 six days. The reservation is already in, the six days is up for sale. There it is right out of the gate, the Kove stands firmly in unicorn territory. And 
as for Kovei's biggest problem, it's not actually a problem with the bike. Sadly, it's a problem with where it's made. The Kovei is entirely designed, engineered, and built in China, and while it does draw inspiration from the world's best rally bikes, it is not a clone or a copy. Now, I know a lot of people just wrote it off because of where it's built, and I totally get it. I guarantee that there will be comments about how buying anything from China is helping the enemy. And believe me, without getting overly political, I am not a fan of the CCP either. But please remember, this is a review of a motorcycle, not a country, not a government. I yearn for the day when I can review a Chinese motorcycle and not have to mention China at all where I don't have to bring up the stereotypical reference to bad clones, substandard performance, and pot metal parts, not to mention deal with the slew of unnecessarily political to blatantly racist comments. But I can tell you straight away with full honesty, this motorcycle crushes any of those stereotypes. Because perhaps the quality of a motorcycle has less to do with the government in power, the race of the worker, or the location of the factory, and more to do with the quality control, factory tolerances, worker skill, and passion of the designers and engineers. And really, if you love your motorcycle but hate China, no matter what you do, don't Google CF Moto, GAC Honda, and absolutely do not click the link in the description to the ADV Rider thread that deep dives into where your motorcycle and its parts all come from. After all, it's better when you just eat the hot dog and forget how it's made, right? For now, brutal honesty number two, I was so impressed with my week on the Kove that when I gave it back to GPX, I asked to become an affiliate. I think it's going to change the motorcycle world. Now to clarify, first came my week of testing, then came the review and 99% of this script. Then I asked to be an affiliate and was just recently accepted and then added in the part about being an affiliate. This review's outcome would be the same regardless of whether I was accepted as an affiliate or not. And here it comes, people mashing their keyboards, calling me a shill, a sellout, a communist, and that is all good. If I were in your shoes, I'd probably troll me too. But if you've been around the channel for a while, you know that I only recommend quality products that I fully believe in. And I've got a garage full of subpar stuff sent to me by moto companies that I've never recommended on my channel to prove it. And if you were in my shoes and got to ride a legitimate rally bike for a week, you might feel the same, and I'm not the only one. After testing the demo bike, the editor for a Top Moto magazine also ordered the Kove 450 Rally, but I'm going to leave it up to him to reveal that for himself, and I promise you that mine will not be the only positive review. People are going nuts over this bike. So is this Kove a legitimate rally bike? Let's talk about the 2023 Dakar Rally, the toughest, most demanding long-range rally in the world. Two weeks and 5,281 brutal miles of sand, rocks, mud, and dust. It is truly designed to break both man and machine. Since 1979, 23 riders have died in the Dakar. It is no joke. The Kobe Rally team ran three bikes in the Dakar this year, and all three bikes finished. 46th, 67th, and 77th out of the 90 finishers. Now haters might say, who cares, they finished back of the pack, that's barely competitive. But remember, the rest of the pack consisted of the best rally bikes piloted by the fastest riders in the world. KTM, Husqvarna, Sherco, Honda, and Gas Gas factory teams. When you look at the results and add in the 49 withdrawals from the Dakar, the Kove had as many top-tier rally bikes behind it as were ahead. And yes, Kove had a team of engineers and mechanics there to work on the bikes, but so did every other team. Many top-tier factories had six-figure machines and huge teams of mechanics and still couldn't finish. That's not saying they're bad. It just illustrates how difficult the Dakar really is. Finishing the Dakar with all three entrants is a huge accomplishment for any factory, especially when it's a factory's first entry and the racers have had no previous roadbook rally experience. Well, I'm kind of a doubting Thomas, and even after the Dakar, I still had a lot of doubts about the Kove status as a legitimate rally bike, or even a decent bike for that matter. See, the prejudices and bad memories of previous Chinese motorcycles that I've owned and reviewed run especially deep for me. 
After I posted a not entirely positive review about a Chinese adventure motorcycle several years ago, the PR guy for that importer absolutely slandered me publicly on the company's blog. And that really didn't help the whole imposter syndrome, suicidal ideation thing. My family and I received threats from hardcore fans of these bikes. It was not a fun time. Then, just last year, we spent 40 days riding Chinese clones in the Dominican Republic, and it was so fun, but those bikes were really? abysmal. But then again, I do personally own a Chinese-made GPX FSE 250, and I really enjoy it. So, is the Kove legit, or did Team Kove just limp through the checkpoints before time ran out? So how do we compare the Kove to an actual rally bike? Well, I've tested expensive bolt-on replica kits that were cool, but still not the real thing. When I think of a real rally bike, I think of machines so untouchable, so mythical, that they only exist in the sexy dreams. The guys who ride real rally bikes have perpetually perfect 5 o'clock shadows, exotic, hard-to-pronounce names, and obliterate ladies' undergarments with the gentle roll of the throttle. For middle-class, middle-aged, mentally unstable men like me, a rally bike in the garage is simply out of the question. Or is it? Let's shift gears a minute and talk about rally cars. It's the late 1990s. A quirky Japanese car company known best for a sport utility wagon is trying to make a name in the States. And then bam, the Impreza. A mass-produced, relatively inexpensive rally car faster in a straight line than muscle cars costing three times as much, light and agile with an all-wheel drive system that gripped like nothing else on U.S. soil. The Impreza became the face of rally in America. Muscle car fanboys and Subaru critics were shocked as it dominated everything from the WRC to traffic light drag races and forever cemented its rightful place as a paragon of not just rally racing, but all of car culture. But to my surprise, I found out that Subaru is not even close to the most winning car in WRC history. So why is the Pleiades badge synonymous with rally in the United States? It's because the Impreza was accessible. It was as close to a real rally car as you could legally get, and anybody could own one. And just look what it did to car culture, to tuning, and to the market here in the States. Ford, Toyota, Hyundai, VW, Mitsubishi, all vying for those hooligan dollars, creating better cars, better tuning, and lifting the whole segment, not just in rally, but in consumer cars as well. Like Subaru in the early 2000s, Kove is an underdog on a mission. They're producing a legitimate rally bike for the masses. Not a blue road bike with rally styling and knobby tires. Not a heavy, gutless rally wannabe with brittle red plastics. This is a legitimate, rally-ready, Dakar-proven machine. a shill or a sellout, it's all good. I imagine the Subi guys in the mid-90s endured the same, but I can honestly recommend it without a speck of guilt or hesitation. But how did I get so excited about the Kove after such harrowing experiences with past Chinese motorcycles? Well, the answer is simple. I was brainwashed by the Spy Balloon's laser beam mind control. No, just kidding. Let's start with the Kove's specs compared to the KTM 450 Rally replica. The KTM 450 replica cranks out an estimated 70 plus horses. We don't really know because KTM doesn't release the spec. The Kove consumer spec that I got to ride claims a modest but respectable 51 horsepower. Both bikes hold over 8 gallons of fuel. The KTM weighs 306 pounds dry. The Kove is 14 pounds heavier. The Kove's Yuan forks are similar to high-end Showa's. KTM is using its latest cone valve tech, which is spectacular. So, the KTM is superior, no questions about it. But it's pretty neck and neck in a lot of areas. Very close seat height, suspension travel, bore and stroke, the list goes on. But the price of the KTM Rally Replica? $27,200 US. And there's only 70 of them made. The price of the Kove that I rode? $9,000. Judging by the price, the Kove does not pass the real rally bike test, but based on the specs, the Dakar results, and the drag races that I'm about to show you, 
well, I'll let you decide if it's a real rally bike or not. My favorite motorcycle ever, still to this day, is the venerable KTM 500, which I own two of. When I had the Kobe for review, I raced it against both of my 500s, first against a 2015 uncorked dirt spec, and then later against my 2022 street legal six days. Surely, the undisputed bosses of Euro Enduro would clobber the chubby Chinese challenger. I gotta get my rear camera on because I kind of have a feeling I know what's gonna happen. <laughs> All right, ready? Three, two, one. Go! Oh dang, you were right there! I thought I completely blew you away! Wow! That freaking blows my mind because this bike's a rocket ship! I'm gonna start just a hair behind you and see what happens, okay? Ready? Set? Go! Ready, Gary? Ready. This is your this is your princess on the line here, dude. <laughs> Are you gonna count us? Down? Okay, he's gonna count us down. So that's not just numbers on a spec sheet. The Kove has sack loads of legitimate power. The same power to weight ratio, in fact, as a Nissan GTR. For the sake of time, the drag races you saw in this video are just a few of many. I'll upload a video of more drag races, but you should know that all the results were pretty much the same. Uncorked, the KTM would win. Corked versus corked, the Kove easily won every time. So how would I describe the power? Well, I'll be honest, despite being pretty quick, it actually feels kind of sad down low. My friend George rode it for a few minutes and said it felt like a Honda 300L, and I can see where he was coming from, but he must not have gotten it up past 6,000 RPM, because that's where the wheelie demon lives. The drag races prove it's got far more in that heavily tuned 450 Zongshan motor than what you get to in the first 4,000 revs. You just have to flog all 450 little beasties for about 6,000 spins to wake them up. And I'm dying to know how fast it would be if its emissions equipment were to be uh, lost in a boating accident or something. Down low, it's torquey and chunky, reminiscent of a KLR 650, but not as thumpy on the old meat cheeks. The back tire just tractors up stuff like this. Look at that grip and that slow churning torque. To me, that's just as nice to watch as the fast stuff, because riding slow, technical stuff like this is always harder than the fast and flowy. Once it revs higher, I'd equate it to how a Honda 450RL feels at similar RPMs, with 10 more horses. Like the Honda, it doesn't have just fistfuls of endless power, but up near the red line, it's smooth, linear, and responsive. Unlike Honda's 450 though, I didn't experience flameouts, overbearing engine braking, or stuttering down low. On the road, Kove claims a top speed of 105, but with my open face helmet and sunglasses, I chickened out in the mid 90s. But at 80 miles per hour, it hums at a steady 7,000 RPMs, and it's stable, calm, and wildly smooth for a single cylinder. This is helped by the cush drive, the dampened handlebars, and the dual overhead cams. 
The wind protection, seat comfort, and freeway stability reminds me of a Gen 2 KLR650, but smoother with better power at 80. We've talked a lot about power, but power means nothing if you can't put it to the ground. How is the Kove suspension? Well, go ahead and take a look for yourself. Weekend warriors will think this looks pretty dang good, advanced riders might think it's blowing through the stroke and notice some adjustments that might need to be made, but through all of my testing, sand, mud, whoops, g-outs, and general desert gnar up to about 70 on a few choice trails, I bottomed out exactly twice. Two times is not bad for stock clickers, and the suspension is fully adjustable, rebound damping and compression. And remember that this drone footage was shot when the bike still had 48 pounds of fuel in the tanks and had no suspension adjustments made since leaving the crate. It did give me a little pat on the bum a few times, but for a bike with a low slung 8 gallons of fuel in it, frankly that Yuan suspension did an outstanding job. Both on and off road, the Kove is stable, comfortable, and planted. In the high RPMs, I could feel it still had enough grunt to lift the front wheel whenever I needed, with a little throttle blip and suspension finesse. The suspension feel and handling reminded me of a bike that I know very well, the Showa Forks on the legendary Honda XR650R. Like the Big Red Pig, you can still tell the Kove is quite buxom, but like a warhorse, it manages to soak up, plow through, or charge over whatever it's pointed at. And while the suspension flow feels thick and industrial, and the profile of the bike looks quite portly, check it out from the top. It's like a full-figured pinup with all the right dimensions, narrow enough in the waist to feel like a dirt bike, but with curves in all the right places. The Kove is a lazy mechanic's dream to perform basic maintenance on. Pull a tab under the seat and you've got access to your air filter, battery, and electronics within three seconds. The air filter is positioned high on the bike between the tanks like the old Husaberg design to keep it much cleaner than running the air box near the rear wheel. It takes two thumb screws to remove the air filter, no tools needed. The fairing, windshield, and tool kit are easily accessed and removed with just one hand by quarter turn thumb screws like you'd find on a DRZ's air filter cover. Most external hardware on the Kove is robust and dampened and uses just one or two sizes of hex key or Torx wrench to remove it all. When I returned the Kove to GPX after the initial week, they mentioned it needed a few bolts tightened before they took it to AIM Expo and then to Baja to bash it around for themselves. And that was it. A week of punishment, bouncing off the rev limiter, drag racing for a solid hour, mashing through whoops, sand, and rocks, all on the break-in oil. Then, after weeks of being rallied hard by several ADV publications for hundreds more miles, I rode it again, and it was just as tight as the first day that I had it. So what are the service intervals like on the Kove? GPX claims that the 450 Rally has valve check intervals of 5,000 miles and oil changes every 2 to 3,000 miles depending on how you're riding it. With that big chunky Zongshen motor and its oil capacity, I believe it. What creature comforts does the Kobe have? The full color TFT screen is big, decently bright, beautiful, and rivals what I've seen on high-end European adventure bikes. Navigation with the left hand controls is intuitive with an up, a down, a select, and a back button. The screen shows revs, miles per hour, odometer, temperature, ABS status, gear selection, battery status, you know, the standard stuff for a nice big adventure bike, but far more than the run of the mill computer on most dual sports. But this computer also logs your next maintenance. It records your average speed, average fuel consumption, trip time, elevation, and air temperature. And it can be customized with different faces and dials, with two skins preloaded like a smartwatch. It can connect to your phone with Bluetooth or Wi-Fi and relay relevant trip information from your phone's GPS. The bike can automatically turn on the lights and dim the screen to night mode when it's dark. A phone or tablet can be mounted under the TFT screen and there's a USB port on the right side of the tower to power your device. As for gas mileage and range, my friends and I were flogging it all week and the readout said we were using 2.2 gallons per 100 miles or 45 miles per gallon. With its 8 gallon tank, the Kove has a max range of 360 miles. That is a huge range, and unless you're crossing a massive desert or riding it in the Dakar, it's almost unnecessary. 
Gary of GPX mentioned the idea of actually sectioning off one of the tanks to store water instead of fuel. And since I've nearly died of dehydration more than one time, I really like that idea. Other little features that they've thought of, there are holes pre-tapped for a steering stabilizer. On the back of the bike, there are these big dampened rubber loops both above and below the fender to strap luggage to. The exhaust sounds great and is routed low to reduce heat on the rider leg and leave room for those big fuel tanks. There's a massive real carbon skid plate that protects the tanks, the motor, the radiators, the foot controls, and most importantly, your own feet. The rear sprocket is two-piece, so you have the weight of aluminum on the inside, but the strength of steel at the teeth. The foot pegs are nice and chunky. The seat is actually quite comfortable, and I'm very picky about seats because I've had several surgeries directly on the old Death Star exhaust port. Uh, more brutal honesty there. There's a cool little toolkit hidden in a hatch by the skid plate. You know, I wouldn't say that the Kove is luxurious or over-the-top bougie at all. It's something that can still be used and abused without crying over. And what about the fit and finish and the feel? Well, no rattles, no weird vibrations or sketchy sounds. It has perfectly capable brakes for on and off-road use without too much twitch or play. Actuation of the throttle and all the levers felt buttery. And even after a month of constant abuse from both GPX and reviewers, everything still felt tight. What about problems? Surely it can't be perfect and it is not. Let's dig into those. Through the video, you'll notice that the headlights and blinkers will occasionally blink, but not in the way that you want them to. The blinkers did not work on this model. There was obviously a loose plug at the harness that I never bothered to fix. On the second Kove, the electronics worked perfectly. When I rode the Kove again after a month of testing by other publications, the front brake had a very slightly lumpy feeling to it when pulled, like what happens when fork oil gets on your brake pads. Stopping power was still 100% there, so I don't think it was fork oil, but it almost felt like ABS was still like 10% active. Shift timing needs to be spot on when you're revving this thing out. If you hit the rev limiter, it feels like it's engine braking hard and really holds you up with some force. The pre-production model that I rode came with tubeless tires on a spoked wheel, and I was sorely disappointed that both of those tires went flat during testing. In fact, all the drone footage of me in red pants, I've got a flat front tire. That's actually kind of a testament to the suspension and the handling of the bike and the sidewall of that stock front tire because it still had about seven gallons of fuel at the time that was filmed. Well, I let Gary at GPX know that the tires needed tubes and rim locks. He immediately contacted Kove and within a few minutes had a text back to me with a screenshot from Kove saying that they'd be adding proper tube tires and rim locks to the bikes that ship this summer. A side note, when criticism and feedback from a regular rider like myself can be remedied by the factory within minutes and integrated into the final product, how awesome is that? I don't care if the factory is in China, North Korea, or Iran. If they listen to rider feedback and improve the bike, that's more than Austria can say. And yeah, shots fired right at KTM for many rides soured by shoddy fuel pumps, faulty TPI sensors, and the myriad of problems that they've refused to even acknowledge. All right, KTM rant over, back to the Kove. When we were testing the bikes, we got it down to about five gallons, and the readout on the screen suddenly jumped to one tick and not five, which made us very nervous. After about five minutes, it read five ticks again, so perhaps a glitch from having three separate tanks, I don't know. The clutch pull on the Kove is pretty standard, but started to feel a little stiff in slow sand or gnarly single track stuff. The ABS settings on the bike will turn back on every time you turn the key off, so that's annoying. And waiting for the screen to boot up so you can access that ABS setting took too long for my taste. I mentioned these gripes to Gary and he said he'd try to include a switch for the ABS in the production models that come this summer. On the handlebars, the set and back buttons for the computer are hard to reach, even with my big weird gorilla thumbs. I wish they would swap the computer controls with the hazard light switch for better ergonomics. 
I think that my biggest complaints about the Kove were actually cosmetic. The white plastics got a little grungy and in some areas are already kind of scuffy and discolored, and the stock graphics on it just don't really do it for me. But as you can see, there is a lot of real estate on this bike to customize it with your own graphics and make it look like the rally bike of your dreams. Now I'd like a 1940s style pinup image of my wife in some lingerie riding a bomb. But uh, yeah, she said no to that. Now I personally like the look of a stacked lighting setup better than the shark face look on the Kove, but these lights are powerful LEDs and cast a lot of light, and they do make the bike look a little more like the front of a car, which may help drivers see you a little better in traffic. The stock tires are 50-50 CST tires that did fine, and I was especially impressed with the sidewall on the front tire when it went flat, but I will likely swap them out with chunkier 70-30 off-road bias tires when I get mine this summer. And that's about it. Those are the only cons that I could find during my week-long test. But let's address some other concerns about this bike that I've gleaned from lurking in other forums, video comment sections, and the like. First of all, unlike the big players, Kove does not have a massive dealership network in place. But if you shop on Amazon, then you already are familiar with how GPX does business. Even when I have to visit a dealership for parts, they rarely have the part in stock and it has to be shipped to me just the same. But what about parts that break often on any bike, like levers, blinkers, and plastics? If I snap a lever, how long am I going to be stuck without a bike until one arrives? It may be a good idea to lurk around on GPX forums and see how their parts distribution works and how long it takes to get parts. On GPX's website, they already have the full parts diagram with every bolt, nut, and doodad available for the Kove, but prices aren't listed yet. So I am counting on GPX to stock an ample supply of parts so us early adopters aren't left out to dry should we need something replaced. And like on any bike, it's probably a good idea to carry around a few spare levers in your toolkit anyway. And what about deep dive mechanical support? I mean, a motor is a motor, but sometimes there are just quirks that dealership mechanics know best. Most dirt bike and dual sport riders are fairly comfortable with working on their own machines, but with the Kove, like any brand new bike, you can't just Google something like KTM 500 faulty fuel pump and get a whole bunch of YouTube videos explaining how to fix something that's been a well-documented problem for the last decade. Can you tell I'm still bitter about that? Well, my guess is that early adopters like myself will have to be active in the Kove forums and be willing to wrench on their own machines and share their experiences with other owners. As for aftermarket parts, the Kove is not a clone, so parts that fit other bikes might not bolt onto the Kove so readily. I would love to see this motorcycle sell well so that reliable aftermarket companies get involved in aftermarket part creation. Wink wink, nudge nudge, tusk. Not only that, but if it sells well, maybe other companies will build an accessible rally bike. Competition is always a good thing for capitalism. And speaking of capitalism, let's talk about the price. For critics, $9,000 seems like a lot to pay for a motorcycle coming from China. And before I rode the Kove, I agreed. That's quite a lot of money for any motorcycle, especially with unicorn status used bikes like my eight-year-old KTM 500 being available for $1,500 less. There was sarcasm there if you missed it. Uh, inflation sucks. But don't forget, this isn't just a gutless pogo suspension trail scooter with a red sticker that says Rally on the side. It's an actual rally motorcycle that beat as many top-of-the-line rally bikes as it lost to in the world's hardest rally. So, the Kove 450 Rally has specs within striking distance of the best rally motorcycles in the world. Its suspension and handling feels just as good as the Baja bossing Honda XR650R with power that combines the thumpy torque of a KLR down low with the smooth revs of a 450L up high. And stock versus stock, cork versus cork, it beat my KTM 500 in a drag race despite its weight and fuel. It boasts the fuel range on par with a BMW GSA. It has the comfort of a Gen 2 KLR, the easily handled dry weight of a DRZ 400S, the cruising speed that comfortably handles America's fastest highways, creature comforts that rival top-end ADVs, and a notably long service interval. What about that does not scream unicorn? 
Now, early in the review, I mentioned the surveys of dual sport and ADV rankings with thousands of participants. Where does the Kove 450 Rally rank in my own personal opinion? The Honda 450L scores an 8.25 off-road, and to me, the Kove felt just as capable in the dirt. The Kove would lose points because it's heavier, but gain a little bit back because it's faster, more powerful, smoother in fast chop, and weirdly better down low in the torquey situations due to Honda's low speed flame out issues. But that weight does make a big difference, so I personally would score the Kove 7.75 or maybe even an 8 off road, slightly lower than the Honda 450L. But there's no doubt that it's better than a stock DRZ or XR650R, which both scored a 7.5. On the road, I think the Kove is better than a Gen 2 Kawasaki KLR650, with just a hair less comfort, but smoother highway cruising, 150 miles more range, and 15 more horsepower for passing with a lot less weight. The KLR scored a 7 for on-road performance, so I actually think that's a conservative on-road score for the Kove. With a 7.75 off-road and a 7 for on-road, the Kove has a total range of capability of 14.75. That's half a point higher than the Husqvarna FE350, and in my honest opinion, it has the largest range of capability of any dual sport or adventure motorcycle. So that is definitely unicorn status, and when you look at it in that light, $9,000 is an insane value. I really don't care where it's from. The Kove 450 Rally is a powerful, beautiful, capable, and most importantly, accessible unicorn of a rally motorcycle. With bikes like this 450 Rally, Kove is set to change the West's perception of Chinese-built motorcycles, and in turn, change off-road motorcycling forever for the better. But one of the biggest things that sold me on this bike is the passion of the people making and importing it. Go watch a few videos, I'll link them in the description. These guys are goony, they're happy-go-lucky, they're just us from a different part of the world. These guys are riders like us, they get it. They're passionate about building motorcycles that they want to ride, not just sell. They're stoked about racing, about off-road. They're scrappy underdogs on a mission. Unlike Japanese manufacturers, Kove is not a subsidiary of some behemoth car company that needs to tick a box on a spreadsheet to keep their moto division alive. Unlike KTM Varna Gas, they're not the king of the hill resting on their laurels, letting their riders eat cake while buying up factory after factory and homogenizing them all. Kove knows that the West's image of Chinese-built motorcycles is not good, and they know that they need to fight incredibly hard to crush those Western stereotypes and build a name for themselves. And with the Kove 450 Rally, they're off to a magnificent start. So now you see why I not only bought my own Kove 450 Rally, but why I'm absolutely comfortable recommending it to you too. As always, a massive thanks to the producers, patrons, and my excellent friends who come to my rallies, who have stuck around to make videos like this possible. This video was a beast to make. So much footage, so much time in the seat, and a lot of work editing and scripting, so I really appreciate you taking your precious time to watch it. That really does mean a lot to me. If you want to be one of the first to own the Kove 450 Rally like me, using the link in the description helps me a ton with a small commission. And as a thanks for staying until the end, use that link and mention this video when you reserve your Kove 450 Rally and GPX will cut the reservation cost from $1,000 to $500. And if you'd rather wait to see if the final Kove is as good as the one I got, I still want to thank you for watching, so mention this video when you book one of this fall's rallies or uh, mental health retreats is what we're calling them now, and we will throw in an extra day at the Moto Mansion so you can ride around in the Badlands or two free months of bike storage here in southwest Utah so that you can fly in and ride easy peasy. And again, this bike is amazing, very easily a unicorn when it comes to its range of capability. You will not regret buying one. Much love as always. Ever ride out.